Most people know very well that social and cultural transformations are complex. And yet, we often seem prepared to think of individual media as bringing change. We believe that there was a situation before this or that media, and then another situation after. Sometimes there are worries about this subsequent situation, or nostalgia for how things were before. In other instances, people wager hope that novel media might bring positive or empowering changes. When media technologies are seen as transformative, they have often been described as new media. The term new media began to acquire some currency in the 1960s, in the age of television. But its use exploded in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Why? Many answers were put forward. The internet, interactivity, multimedia, mobile devices, user-generated content. But for some, the new media of this moment came out of a longer-term and more general development. The rise of the computer as a media technology. Not just a new addition to all the other technologies, rather an emergent backbone for virtually all mediated communication and experience. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will also be students in my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. This is the second edition of the series, which includes some new elements added to the episode in autumn 2021. In this episode, the fifth in our series, we focus on computational technologies. The key idea I want to get across is this. Media forms seem to be increasingly absorbed into the computer as an umbrella medium. But computers do not just simulate prior media. They increasingly embody their own logics of mediation. It has been two decades after it was first published, and Lev Manovich's 2001 book, The Language of New Media, still remains one of the defining discussions of what it might mean to speak about specifically new media. We're all too ready, Manovich says, to accept apparently digital phenomena such as the internet, websites, video games, DVDs, or virtual reality as new media. But when we're confronted with something like TV programs or even printed newspapers, they are neither considered new or digital even though television today is often filmed and edited with digital technologies, while printed newspapers today are fundamentally the products of digital layout and design software. Manovich says we tend, at least when he was writing in 2001, to connect new media only with computer-based distribution and exhibition, but less so to production and storage. And this underplays an emergent set of technological changes more significant than the print revolution. The printing press only fundamentally affected one stage of communication, the distribution of media. The rise of computers, Manovich says, alters all stages of communication and all types of media. Manovich uses the word language in the title of his book, since he sees new media as ultimately rooted in the language of computation. New media objects, as he calls them, are articulated around five principles. These are a little abstract, but stay with me. First, Numerical representation. All new media objects, whether created using computers or old analog media converted to digital, can be boiled down to numerical data, ultimately to the ones and zeros of binary code. This means that all new media objects can be described in purely mathematical terms and manipulated automatically using algorithms. Second is modularity. All new media objects are built out of some kind of discrete element, Singular bits that can be separated out and then reassembled again. Manovich lists pixels, polygons, voxels, characters, and scripts. Third, automation. 
When this numerical representation and modularity are combined, it then becomes possible to modify new media objects automatically, without human intervention. It is why, for example, all those photo apps can automatically detect and modify your digital images using pre-programmed filters. Fourth is variability. New media objects can exist in potentially infinite versions. This is different to some so-called old media, for example a phonograph record, which embed information once and for all into an object or signal transmission in a particular order. The final principle is transcoding. Think about how you view a digital image. Mainly you see it in terms of how it looks, rather than its technical makeup. But that image is also a product of computer logic and properties such as file type, size, format, compression. Transcoding describes how new media objects involve both a cultural layer and a computer layer, with the latter largely beyond our perception. What is significant here is that the proliferation of new media objects and their largely hidden logics is gradually changing how we understand and represent ourselves. Now, Manovich also does something a little surprising, even confusing, in this book. Almost immediately after outlining these abstract principles, he almost seems to contradict himself. He's demarcated what comprises specifically new media objects, but then he elevates cinema as the original new media. It is cinema, he says, that we find early flickers, pun intended, of digital media. For example, film is also discrete, allowing snipping, remixing, and sampling. Film is also multimedia, combining moving image, text, and sound. Earlier in the book, he also somewhat artfully notes these fateful early intersections of cinema and computing. The diagrams for Alan Turing's Universal Machine are notably akin to a film projector, he notes. And German engineer Konrad Zuse actually reused exposed 35mm film rolls to punch in data inputs for his early digital computer. This anticipated, Manovich says, the convergence to come, in which the, quote, iconic code of cinema is discarded in favor of the more efficient binary one. Cinema becomes slave to the computer, end quote. There are critiques of Manovich's The Language of New Media, including in Mark Hansen's 2004 book, New Philosophy for New Media, and in Alexander Galloway's 2012 book, The Interface Effect. Both regard Manovich's surprising elevation of cinema as problematic. It's almost as if Manovich wants to have it both ways, to set out principles that delineate a completely novel new media, and then at the same time to show how old media such as cinema, a media form which Manovich clearly harbors a special sympathy and interest, also possess the similar qualities. Galloway acknowledges the enduring value of Manovich's argument, even today, It puts forward, he says, a basic set of principles for new media objects which compel a critical and historical response, precisely because the qualities are, quote, so structural, so abstract, so synchronic, end quote. But Galloway argues that it is also here that Manovich has some weaknesses, the same as those with Marshall McLuhan or Friedrich Hitler. His principles overfocus on the, quote, formal essence of the medium, the techniques and characteristics of the technology, end quote seemingly casting aside social and political history. Another book, contemporaneous to Manovich's and important for questions we're going to consider later, is Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin's Remediation, Understanding New Media. As the title suggests, this book argues for an approach to new media that emphasizes relationships with the old. New media do not replace old media. Rather, New media are founded on a process of remediation, in that they inherently adapt, reference, incorporate, and refashion prior media. So, early cinema might be seen to remediate existing theatrical conventions, computer games reference cinema, websites readapt aspects of magazine layout, and email references postal systems like mailbox, inbox, send, folders, cc, address. We can see today how music is best seen as a complex chain of remediations, for example, between live performance, phonographs, gramophones, vinyl LPs, 8-tracks, cassettes, compact discs, the MP3 format, and streaming services. Writing in the year 2000, Bolter and Grusin clearly want to argue that digital interfaces exemplify processes of remediation, but they also repeatedly emphasize how the concept applies to all media. This is clear in how they tease out what they call the double logic of remediation, involving a kind of give and take between immediacy and hyper-immediacy. By immediacy, they mean the power for us to be immersed in a medium. Perhaps the extreme example of this would be virtual reality, but all mediums offer forms of immersion. 
for example, reading a novel or watching a film. What is important about immediacy is that it implies the relative disappearance of the medium. Hyperimmediacy refers to the potential for our attention to be drawn back to the medium itself. One example Bolter and Grusin put forward is the overlapping collage of media presented to us in the heterogeneous Windows style of the web. Through YouTube, for example, we may access Windows to immediacy, being momentarily immersed in a video clip or film, but the platform also demands we repeatedly return to its windowed interface of related videos. But again, this tension can also be seen in much older media. Bolter and Grusin point out how, in early books, the first letter on the page was often ornately detailed with iconography and imagery. This shows both immediacy, because it is integrated with the overall text, but also hyperimmediacy, inviting the reader to step back and admire how the book itself integrates image and text. It is worth pausing at this point and considering the histories of computing. Not in general, but as they intersect with the histories of media technologies. As Menovich points out, well into the 20th century, media machines and data processing machines largely developed in parallel, without crossing paths. Now, a disclaimer. Even if we were to focus in on the aspects of computing history which lay the grounds for an eventual convergence with media technologies, there would still be far more to cover than we can here. We will not only need to be selective, but also thematic rather than chronological. In other words, I need to affirm my usual line around exploring the connections between the present and the past, but not always in a historically linear progression. Balbi and Maga Uda's 2018 book, A History of Digital Media, offers an extensive account of computing history, far more comprehensive than we can cover here. While we will not fully follow their more chronological approach, the four phases they identify for the socio-technical history of computers provides a useful starting point to orientate ourselves. They call the first phase of computing the mechanical age, lasting from around 2500 BC until the mid-1930s. This embodies a very long historical period in which various forms of mechanical calculation or automated operations were used in industrial production and in the large-scale enumeration of populations. The second phase is the mainframe age from the mid-1930s into the mid-1970s. Here we see the rise of the enormous mainframe computers, machines that weighed thousands of kilograms and filled expansive rooms, directed at data processing, especially for military and scientific ends. The third phase is that of the personal computer, beginning in the mid-1970s until the 2000s. This is where we begin to see computers become ordinary media, not only increasingly widespread in working environments, especially offices, but also in the home, accessible as an everyday technology. And finally, our current period, which they call the post-PC age. Today, computers are less and less singular things, such as the PC. Computation is ubiquitous, and network capacity is found across a whole gamut of technologies, which we can even wear or build into our physical environments. Part of this evolution story will be familiar. Computers becoming media through a recursive process of domestication, just like the phonograph, the telephone, radio, or television. Computers have gone from calculators to communicators in significant part because they have become woven into our daily life. Balbi and Mega Uda describe this as an incremental process in which gigantic mainframe computers become smaller, largely thanks to the development of microprocessors, and able to be used by individuals thanks to a move towards time sharing and desk based interfaces such as keyboards. Like other media, the possible significance of computers for ordinary users was not seen initially. In the 1970s, companies like Hewlett Packard thought home computers were unfeasible technically and also unviable as consumer goods. They were soon to be proven very wrong. But there are other things at play in looking at computing histories. There is a key tension, even a contradiction, at play with the emergence of computers, particularly in the latter half of the 20th century. On the one hand, Balbi and Maga Uda point out, the development of computing owes a lot to military applications, to the waging and fighting of wars. It was in military laboratories at Bletchley in Buckinghamshire that Alan Turing helped build Colossus, one of the first digital computers, developed to break the German Enigma code during World War II. The German engineer Konrad Zuse, mentioned earlier, developed his largely forgotten computer around the same time in Nazi Germany. And in the war's immediate aftermath, computing played a crucial role in the United States' Manhattan Project, which led to the first atomic bomb. Writing in 1964, Lewis Mumford saw these pursuits, which enable mass surveillance and weapons of mass destruction, as potentially leading to a new authoritarian technics, quote, 
whose chief byproduct would be the mutilation or the extermination of the human race, end quote. There is also a connection here to anxieties about how computational systems have reached such complexity that they can, even need, to act without human intervention or approval. Might this lead to a new kind of self-generative or non-human authoritarianism? Well, this is now a frequent theme in mainstream science fiction, for example, The Terminator or The Matrix film franchises, which suggests that artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, androids, and so on might eventually, perhaps unexpectedly, overtake humanity. And yet on the other hand, there's a rather different narrative, captured well in Fred Turner's 2008 book From Counterculture to Cyberculture. At the height of the Cold War, mainframe systems and data processing were at the very heart of the military-industrial complex. But Turner shows how new, experimental, utopian, and libertarian ideas about computing emerge out of the late 1960s California countercultural scene. This led, by the 1990s, to a very different image of computing— and in particular the internet, as a means of free expression and collaboration. Two notable Steves were part of this California countercultural computing scene in the early 1970s, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. By 1976, they were demonstrating a prototype computer, encased in handcrafted wood, called the Apple I. In the next year, after a cash infusion from an investor, they had produced the mass-market Apple II. It was the first computer I ever came across— a single machine tucked away in my elementary school library. Another thematic lens onto computing history is as a series of negotiations and renegotiations between what is theoretically possible and what is practically achievable. Negotiations between abstraction and application, between mathematics and mechanics, between software and hardware. Balbi and Magauda cite several examples of this throughout the prehistory of computing. Pascal's and Leibniz's theoretical calculators, as well as Babbage's analytical engine and difference engine, were primarily advances in mathematical theory that were difficult or even impossible to achieve using the mechanics of their time. Similarly, Alan Turing's universal machine in the 1930s was a thought experiment, impossible to realize as an actual working machine, but demonstrably possible through mathematical proof. On the surface, there might appear to be a similar tension going on between software and hardware, or between computer programming and engineering. To an extent, this is true, but it would also be accurate to say the conjunction of coded instructions and the hardware which processes them is insoluble. Only when these are working together do we get the dynamic media technologies of computing. Balbi and Megauda do a good job at recounting one of the most important though often untold, aspects of these relationships of programming and engineering. The influence of woman. The contribution of English mathematician and writer Ada Lovelace, for example, cannot be stressed enough. She was one of the few with the foresight to see the potential of Babbage's analytical engine. But significantly, she recognized that the engine might be applied to more than just solving pure mathematical problems. For Lovelace, the analytical engine, and here we might say computers in general, quote, might act upon other things besides number, were objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, end quote. To potentially apply the analytical machine to problems beyond mathematics, Lovelace helped invent the very notion of programming, developing with Babbage the first conceptual algorithm. Work by historians such as Jennifer Light's 1999 essay, When Computers Were Women, and Mar Hicks' 2017 book, Programmed Inequality, describe the central role of women in software programming in particular. Hicks's analysis shows how post-war British government programs, which eventually transferred technology jobs to men, led to Britain losing its early dominance in computing. My own institution, Birkbeck, has its place in the story of early women computer programmers. Kathleen Booth wrote the assembly language for early computer systems assembled at the college and helped co-found its Department of Computer Science and Information Systems. She and her partner Andrew Booth's team at Birkbeck were the smallest in early British computing, and yet during the 1940s and 50s they still managed to produce three computing machines. Her partner Andrew built the machines, while she wrote the programs. Beginning with the early use of punch cards, software has embodied one of the defining elements of computers. This distinctive role of software only became more important in time. By the mid-1970s, with their Microsoft Basic Programming Language, Bill Gates and Paul Allen had begun to build the first company dedicated to designing and selling software. As we will see, it is arguably via software that computers became media.
In his later 2013 book, Software Takes Command, Lev Manovich decidedly places software at the center of his analysis of contemporary media. He wants to get across the proposition that, if the computer is a medium that simulates and extends previous media, then it does so primarily through software. He means this in general, but his go-to examples, which he examines in some detail, are especially visual editing programs such as Photoshop and Final Cut Pro. And just to underscore how much importance and agency he ascribes to software, in his book's acknowledgments, Manovich not only thanks other people, but the authoring, editing, and communication applications he used during the writing process, from Microsoft Word to Twitter to Illustrator. One of Manovich's objectives in Software Takes Command is to recount the emergence of what he labels vernacular media computing. By this, he means computing allowing ordinary users to author, create, manipulate, store, distribute, and display media. He does this in the first chapter by discussing some of the writings and prototypes developed by Alan C. Kay and other colleagues at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC for short. Xerox PARC helped develop many of the elements which still define much of the user-friendly personal computing we know today, such as the graphical user interface, or GUI, windows, icons, bitmap and color graphics, and crucially, the mouse. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You come into your office, grab a cup of coffee, Good morning, Brad. and a Xerox machine presents your morning mail on a screen. Introduced in 1973, the Xerox Alto was one of the notable computers actually built at PARC. What's the mail this morning? This one looks interesting. Let's uh, take a look at this. It was the first computer designed to work with a GUI operating system and a mouse. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now at the Xerox Research Center in Palo Alto, California. Soon, Xerox systems like this will help you manage your most precious resource, information. The Alto was expensive. Only around 2,000 were produced. Half of these were in Xerox laboratories and about a quarter more in universities. In a well-known story, Steve Jobs visited Park in 1979, and he, alongside other Apple engineers, were given demos on the Alto in exchange for stock options in Apple. What they learned heavily informed the development of Apple's Lisa and then Macintosh systems, and eventually also computers running Microsoft Windows. Manovich describes how, in a detailed 1977 article written by Kay and the computer scientist Adele Goldberg, that the Alto is mindfully given a different name, the Interim Dynabook. The Dynabook was an altogether different device, one that only ever reached an early prototype phase. It was to be the culmination of the Alto, originally proposed and illustrated in 1972 by Kay. To our 21st century eyes, the Dynabook is unmistakably a sort of proto-tablet. Aimed principally at children, it was imagined as an umbrella device that could encompass all existing media. And it would do so by, as transparently as possible, simulating these media. For Manovich, the Dynabook and many of Xerox PARC's other projects treated the computer as a remediation machine. They sought to essentially simulate non-computational media such as typewriters, painting, filing, and so on. However, Kay and Goldberg were also aware that even as their imagined Dynabook would aim to simulate other media in a single device, it would also, in the process, add new properties and capacities. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot where you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called our mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. That'll show you, from another point of view, more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. In December 1968, Douglas Engelbart led a well-known 90-minute demonstration to the Fall Joint Computer Conference in San Francisco. Retroactively named the mother of all demos, it presented most of the elements that would eventually comprise modern office computing, such as Windows, word processing, hypertext, video conferencing, the computer mouse, and real-time collaborative editing. It also heavily influenced the work of Xerox PARC, which refocused the application of such elements in the spheres of arts, media, and education. Manovich discusses the demo with a particular point in mind. 
Though Engelbart does spend some time showing tools that essentially simulate existing office technology such as the typewriter, he quickly moves to show how the system could go further. Manovich homes in especially on Engelbart's demonstration of something he argues was entirely novel, view control. This is the ability to take the same basic information and have it visualized in different ways. Engelbart, for example, created a to-do list, organized by location, and then showed it viewed as a visual graph. With one click, he switched the medium entirely. Mundane-sounding stuff, for sure, but... Manovich's point is that developments like view control are as significant, if not more, than the more enchanting digital phenomena like virtual reality, interactivity, cyberspace, that have consumed so much of our attention. Manovich has sympathies for Bolter and Grusin's notion of remediation, but he also thinks it is limited when it comes to understanding the computer as a metamedium. It can help us understand computational surfaces, such as the simulations presented to us via various GUIs, and it is perhaps particularly useful for observing a novel computational simulation of prior media. But it does not account well for the operation of computational logic below those surfaces. And it is from these depths that Manovich thinks distinctively new kinds of cultural capacities might emerge. David Barry, in a 2013 essay titled Against Remediation, likewise critiques Bolter and Grusin's implicit emphasis on the visual resemblances of media. The concept is desensitized, he says, to the specificities of computation. It offers a depth model, and he means it here in a different way than Manovich, in which there is always a prior media form contained in the new media. And this potentially obscures a breadth model, which pays more attention to the ways in which computational media are also interoperable with each other. Ultimately, Manovich seems to want computers to surpass their role as old media simulators, in ways that go beyond just adding new properties or tools. He sees a future in which computation amounts to genuinely novel forms of mediated communication and experience. Really, Manovich almost seems to regret that this has not yet happened to the extent it might have otherwise. Computers, he says, were not invented to simply simulate other media. Simulations of non-computational media, Manovich says, are only, quote, building blocks to create previously unimaginable representational and information structures, creative and thinking tools, and communication options, end quote. A replay, perhaps, of those negotiations and renegotiations I mentioned earlier in relation to computing history, between what is theoretically possible and what is practically achievable. But away from these questions that surround medium specificity, there is more to say about the connections of computing and media technologies, around the rise of the internet as an infrastructure, which helps make computational media more and more ubiquitous across everyday environments, or around the emergence of embodied forms of media, which increasingly layers computation onto our most ordinary perceptual practices. We will turn to these topics in our next two episodes. So until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media, Technology, and Culture.